Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Yates, for uh, being here with us. Now, I know many of you possibly looked through the entire uh, webinar that had been previously recorded. I'm going to give about an eight minute uh, highlight reel of, of some of the some of the, the best points. Um, but again, I encourage you to go back and, and look at the whole thing if you haven't already. And then we will move into um, motivational discussion. So let me get my screen going. All right. I have a study, and I need to know how many patients I need. I think I only need three patients. OK, what kind of study is it? I'm doing a lab study. Can I just use three patients? That depends. What are you trying to show? We always use three patients. OK, what are you trying to show? I'm trying to show that drug A and drug B are better than only drug A. How are you measuring if it is better? We are looking at apoptosis. Can we just use three patients? What kind of measure of apoptosis? Do you know how variable that measure is? We always use three patients. That is what we have published before. Three patients per group or in total? Yes. OK, let's try something different. What type of measure are you using? And is this an in vitro study? An in vivo mouse study? It is an in vitro study of patient samples, and we are looking at measures of apoptosis after treatment with drug A and drug B versus drug A and control. And drug B alone. Oh, how many groups are you analyzing altogether then? My grant is due tomorrow. I just need to know if I can just use three patients per group. Okay, well, you probably should have come to me earlier for help with this. All I need you to do is tell me that three patients are okay. So, it is not that easy. Your marker for apoptosis may have a large amount of variability associated with it that could make it difficult to ascertain differences based only on three patients per group. It also depends on what kind of outcomes you are looking at. Are you looking at normalized changes in expression levels from baseline? Three patients may not be sufficient to detect differences in these expression levels between the different treatment groups. I do not understand. I'm saying that you may need more than three patients per group, but that I need more information to determine that. The serine protease granzyme B is made in cytotoxic lymphocytes, where it is inactive due to the low pH of the storage granules. It is measured immediately upon delivery into target cell cytoplasms, where the pH is neutral. This is followed by cleavage of Proca's phase 3 by granzyme B in the target cell cytoplasm and the subsequent induction of apoptosis. All proteolytic events can be quantitated at the live single cell level by flow cytometry and imaged by confocal microscopy. I understand very little of what you just said. Maybe we should talk more about this. I just need to know if three patients are enough. My grant is due tomorrow. We will need to meet to better understand this before we can determine the appropriate sample size. I can put you on my grant for half of a percent FDE. You can design and analyze the data later. Do you really think that is enough to do the work? Well, it may be less if it is awarded and the budget is cut. Please go away. So why do we worry about power and sample size? Um, on the surface, we say that we worry about power and sample size because we want to provide assurance that we have a reasonable probability of answering our question, right? We don't want to collect data on 20 subjects and know upfront that that is not enough and we're going to have a huge confidence interval and we're not really going to be able to say anything about the question that we're asking. Um, in practice, we do this because it allows us to figure out exactly the sample size that we need so that we're not using too few and we're not using too many. And as long as we do that, then um, we, the royal we, the funding agencies, 
um, or institutes can efficiently allocate their resources, right? Because money that goes to fund one grant is money that is not available to fund another. So we don't wanna overspend. But there's also an ethical justification, which is that if the study is too large, then we are needlessly exposing additional subjects to intervention that didn't really need to be exposed to that additional risk. On the flip side, if the study is too small, then again, it's sort of needlessly exposing patients because we're not gonna get to be able to conclude what we're trying to conclude with any certainty. That's sort of, sort of on the surface why we worry about power and sample size from the beginning. But now the graph that I just showed you was for a specific value of the alternative hypothesis, okay? What we wanna do when we're designing a study is to think about what is the minimum scientifically important difference that we wanna detect. And in sort of general terms, that's the smallest difference which would result in a change in practice, okay? Uh, sort of the rule of thumb on this is the larger the difference, the smaller the sample size. Um, different disease areas may have uh, in the literature uh, an understanding of what this is for certain types of outcomes. Um, but again, it, it's not necessarily a given. It may be something that you and your um, collaborating experts have to really put some thought into to decide what is the smallest difference that would change practice. How does this impact the sample size? Again, I gave you this rule of thumb, the larger the difference, the smaller the sample size. Um, the curve I'm showing you here, again, represents the null hypothesis, and you can see the rejection region. What I'm showing you now, the curve on the right, is what we would expect under the alternative hypothesis for a one-unit difference, okay? And so you can see that there's a lot of overlap between those curves. So for many possible outcomes as a result of a statistical test, it would be hard to say whether which from which distribution they came, right? But as these two curves get farther apart, so now my curve is centered at a two unit difference, now it's centered at a three unit difference, you can see that those curves become more distinct and it's going to be easier to tell them apart. And again, from a power standpoint, you can see very clearly how that shaded region under the alternative grows as the difference between the null and the alternative gets larger. Okay, now, we also have to think about the variability in our outcome. And what we mean by that is whether the outcome is continuous or categorical. If it's continuous, what we mean is just an estimate of the standard deviation and the variance. Um, if it's dichotomous, then what we mean by variability is really an estimate of the control proportion. What proportion of subjects do we, ex on the control arm, do we expect to have a good outcome? And why does that matter? Again, this, cons this rule of thumb, the larger the difference, the smaller the sample size, ignores the contribution of variability. And so what I'm, show what I'm showing you here is essentially a repeat of the previous slide where you can see what we're looking at is a difference of about three units between the null and the alternative. And with the variability that's present in this particular curve, you can see that they're relatively distinct and it would probably be easy um, in the tails to tell which distribution um, your data support, right? But if the variation increases, these are centered at exactly the same place, but with the variation increasing, those curves become less distinct. And again, it becomes more difficult then to tell them apart, to tell with a particular result from which curve it's more likely. All right. So that is our, our brief review. We're now going to open things up to some questions. We have a, um, we also have some questions that we have kind of internally come up with that we can work through. Um, I did see, Joy, that somebody raised their hands. I, I think it would be okay if we gave them the ability to speak if they did that on purpose, if they want to ask a question live. I don't see it. Do you, can you tell me who it was? <laughs> 
maybe they put their hand back down. It just okay, flashed yeah. on the screen for a moment. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, so Dr. Yates, um, thank you for, again, for being here. Um, I, uh, you know, what I thought were a couple of the, I mean, your, your webinar is great, uh, but I tried to distill it to a couple key points that I think come up frequently. Um, what other things do you think that the broader audience, um, in terms of recurring themes and developing uh, neuroscience trials, what other things do you want um, people to think about when they're thinking about sample size? Yes, that's a great question. I think one of the sort of key notions that's missed is that it uh, is not just about what the endpoint is and what the variability associated with that endpoint is, um, but we have to have an understanding of what the design is going to look like, what the intended hypothesis that you're trying to test is. So um, if you start out by saying, I'm going to do a two sample comparison of control to low dose, and then decide, oh, you know, I don't feel real great about the dose. Um, maybe I need to look into that a little bit more. It's not just, um, it's not necessarily just a matter of adding one arm's worth of subjects to add another dose. Um, so you really need to think about what the, what the experimental design is and what hypothesis you want to test. Um, and all of that needs to be sort of laid out in advance. And if it changes, then you have to go back to the drawing board. Okay, so it's, it's really key to sort of have a good solid plan for what the trial itself is going to look like. Um, so there's a question um, in the, I can see the chat. I don't know that I can see the Q&A. So I'm sorry if I'm going um, out of order. There's a question in um, the chat about the principles of sample size calculation in crossover design studies. So the principles are going to be largely the same. You're going to need to know the same pieces of information, um, but you're also going to need to know some additional things. You're going to need to have an idea as to how correlated the observations will be within a subject over time, uh, and that will have to be taken into account. And you'll also want to know something about whatever washout you expect in between the, the crossover periods um, so that if there is a washout effect uh, or if there is a lingering effect of the treatment from period one into period two, that that can be considered in the sample size population. But the principles are going to be generally the same. The uh, question in the Q&A is from uh, Dr. Stoltz. Given that many continuous outcomes happen to not be parametric, normally distributed, could you talk about the different approaches to these outcomes? Sure, so um, there, there are uh, tests, of course, that you can use that are non-parametric tests that don't require the normality assumption, and there are methods for calculating the sample size if you choose to use those. Um, if the sample size is large enough, uh, you may be able to rely on the limit theorem to still use the parametric sample size calculations as an approximation. Um, the caveat to that is that in some cases, um, a simple two-group comparison by DTET, say, um, is fine for the primary analysis, but then as a secondary, you're going to want to adjust for a bunch of different things. And there are some assumptions that go along with that as well that may not be invoked necessarily just by the large sample size. And so you'll want to, if you have access to that sort of data from the literature and you can sort of uh, scope out in advance whether you think those assumptions will build after the proper adjustments, then that can be reasonable. Um, otherwise, if you start with a non-parametric comparison, then you may want to do non-parametric adjustments as well, and that becomes a little bit more complicated. I think another um, another question that I think we, we're sometimes faced with is, you know, what about um, you know the clinical researchers? What value and approach is there to doing some degree of a back of the envelope calculation to get to get started, so they know that when they're having a conversation, they're in the right galaxy to, with their statistician, like they weren't in the uh, video of the biologist and the statistician. 
right? We all want to avoid being in that video. Um, so I think it depends on what you mean by back of the envelope. Um, there's lots of freeware available that can help you get what I would call a ballpark. Um, and you can start with, uh, in many cases, you might be able to start with a standardized effect size. Um, so, you know, um, there's sort of this rule of thumb that a, a standardized effect size of 0.3 is small, 0.5 is medium, 0.7 is large. Um, and you can sort of play with that um, to get a ballpark, but, but all of it is going to have to be then translated to the specific outcome that you're looking at and the variability that's associated with it. So you can say whether that is a meaningful effect size. So I don't want to say that I don't think it's worth doing some initial exploration, um, but I, I think it's important to just be aware that there are a lot of um, a lot of factors that go into that, and it's often the case that what what we start with when someone comes to us um, is very different than what the final final sample size winds up being. And again, um, you know, Dr. Yates is one of the preeminent experts in the design of, of neurologic trials. So feel free to, to put other questions there in the chat. Um, I do have a few other prepared questions that, that we will go through. And also, if there are other um, statisticians or clinicians who, who wish to share experiences or relevant um, thoughts as we're going on, you know, just, just feel free to put something in the chat. We can either get you on, on audio or um, you can, we can also, also, people will be able to see chat messages if they're um, broadcast to the whole group. Um, and then look, we got a question. So how do sample size targets change, if at all, with adaptive study designs? Does information on variability of the outcome measure gleaned from initial subjects inform sample size moving forward? Um, so the easy answer is that it depends. Um, the sample size targets may change with adaptive st study designs depending on what adaptations you are considering implementing, right? Um, so you may come up with a, an adaptive design where the total sample size is fixed, but the allocation ratio is adaptive. Um, you may come up with an adaptive design that allows for early termination in the case of overwhelming efficacy or overwhelming futility. Uh, or that totally reevaluates the sample size based on the accruing information. So adaptive design can change the target sample size. Um, it's not necessary that they do, not all of them might. Um, but in the cases where you're considering a sample size re-estimation, um, the sample size typically will be, uh, well, the, the preference to maintain um, sort of the unbiased nature of the trial will evaluate the variability of the continuous response and not necessarily the treatment. Um, and so for a binary outcome, it would if come up, it would use a, a pooled estimate of the outcome rate, again, in order to not uh, allow the treatment effect to inform the ultimate sample size of the design. And to put, to, to I guess, make that a little concrete, if you were doing a study where you were looking to see that you, you were expecting there to be a difference of the mortality would go down from 20% to 10%, obviously that's a big change. If over the course of the study you saw that the control rate was more like 50%, um, that would substantially, you know, if you, even with the same absolute effect size going from 50% to 40%, your power would, would go way down but a blinded sample size estimation that saw that the aggregate event rate was 45% would then inflate the sample size to be able to account for that difference in the larger sample as, as sort of like a, I guess, a, a specific example of how that could be used. But there, there are a bewildering potential set of potential types of adaptive designs. So um, I think the thing that's important to know for designing clinical trials to be funded by NIH is that you do have to have a maximum sample size. Um, and that would be what would be the driving principle um, in terms of under your sort of baseline set of assumptions, 
here is what the, the study is going to enroll and, and, and be able to account for that. Um, there is a, a good, a thoughtful comment from uh, Dr. Stoltz. In my experience, coming up with one answer is always fraught with bias and can be justified some way. Your thought on presenting a reasonable range of sample size and power combinations, and, and maybe that's also ranging the assumptions that we're talking about, the variability of those measurements. Right, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, so the, the, only, um, the only way, I think, uh, to, to get around any sort of concern over whether your assumptions are valid is to consider what, uh, what the properties of your design are if you're wrong, right? And this is especially true um, if you're designing uh, a child with a fixed design where the sample size is what it is and you're just going on, right? You want to know if I'm a little off on my variance, how much is my power affected? Um, is it going to be better or worse based on other values that are shown in the literature? Um, and so I think it's incredibly important to show alternatives. Um, if you are doing um, an adaptive design, the way that we would do that, and maybe even in, in a non-adaptive design might be simulation. Um, to show what are a plausible range of scenarios that we might see and would be interested in, you know, making good decisions for and showing what how the design performs under those sort of plausible truths. So yes, that's an excellent point. We, when we design clinical trials, they're based on assumptions. Um, those assumptions are just that, they're assumptions and they, and they could be wrong and we have to understand um, what we have left if they are wrong. And as a, as a follow-up question to that, um, and then we have another question that we can answer right after that, but as a follow-up question to that, Dr. Yates, um, if you could just sort of give a little bit of example in terms of like, let's say you're comparing two normally distributed outcomes, what would be the difference in terms of using simulation to arrive at a sample size estimate versus using, I guess, a more conventional method like a, a power calculator? Can you sort of illustrate just so that that's, I guess, a little demystified for the rest of the audience, because sometimes, you know, we think of simulations as predicting the future. And I think in this case, the simulation has a, has a sort of different intent. Right. So um, in, in the case that uh, Will just mentioned, where we're looking at comparing two normally distributed outcomes, of course, there is a sample size formula that we can use. We can just plug values in. In the case of simulation, what that's doing is essentially making it a little bit more concrete so that for a trial of a particular size, rather than just taking the summary measures for those distributions, we're actually drawing random variates from that distribution. So we would have, you know, in a sample uh, trial of 100 subjects, we would draw 50 subjects from what we consider to be the null distribution, 50 subjects from what we consider to be the alternative distribution, and then we would perform the statistical test and see what happens. And we do that a lot of times um, and keep track of how it's performing so that at the end of the day, if we did that a thousand times or 10,000 times, the number of times that that a particular trial was statistically significant would be the power, essentially. Um, if you do that in this very simple <laughs> case where we're comparing two normally distributed um, or where we're looking at comparing two groups on a normally distributed outcome, they should give you roughly the same answer, right? If we do the sample size calculation based on what's in the textbook and we do it based on simulation. But for many complicated designs, it's just not possible to do it um, sort of in a, in a closed form solution. So the simulation is not really about predicting the future. Um, it's about understanding what could happen and how the design would perform under those circumstances. Um, I think that the next question is um, thinking about what principles you would use to incorporate the predicted crossover rate between study arms in calculating, calculating sample size in advance of an intention to treat analysis. And just to make it simpler, I will just assume they mean the superiority case, because if it was a non-inferiority case, it would be kind of a different answer. But um, for the superiority case, what, what do you think about when you think that there, you know, when you might have a predicted crossover rate? Right. So the, the crossover rate um, is uh, 
in order to understand how to adjust for potential crossover, we have to understand what that crossover actually does to the estimated treatment effect. And what it essentially does is it moves it towards the null, right? It dilutes the treatment effect because patients who were randomized to the intervention but received the control behave more like control patients and vice versa. And so that the effect of that dilution of the treatment effect has to be accounted for in the sample size. So there is an inflation factor, again, for sort of typical, um, if you're looking for a typical closed form solution, there is an inflation factor. Um, it's not, it's the inflation factor is larger than the crossover rate. Um, and again, it's because you're not just excluding those patients and saying, I'm just, I just need to replace them. You're saying the treatment effect is going to be a little smaller than the one I want to detect. And so I need to inflate enough to account for that. And so it actually winds up being a function of the square of the crossover rate. Um, and so what that means is that as the crossover rate gets bigger, the inflation factor gets much bigger. And so it's definitely something to think about. Um, I would also encourage you to think about it, though, from a sort of feasibility and relevance standpoint and not just from a, a sample size inflation standpoint. If the crossover rate that, that you anticipate is really large, then it, I think it speaks to how worthwhile the treatment actually is. If you expect that there's a reason that people are not going to stick with the intervention and they're going to keep moving to the control, then perhaps something about the intervention needs to be revisited, right? Maybe it's tolerability, um, uh, maybe it's lack of effect, there, maybe it's the, the frequency with which they have to meet with people. There's lots of things that can impact that. Um, but as you know, when you start to approach crossover rates of 25, 30% or higher, um, you know, I think you need to start thinking about what might impact that crossover rate and whether it can be, those issues can be addressed. Yeah, and you may also need to think about sort of like the clinical aspects of what's going on there is this is there a question you can be asking about an earlier phase like if, if if this is an acute study like let's say of stroke and people are assigned to a non thrombotic you know they get some new thrombolytic first um and they're they're assigned to say like a non thrombectomy arm but then they worsen and they get crossed over to thrombectomy you may Well, we lost you. Well, I still can't hear you. No, you're still silent. Yes, so <laughs> thank you, Will. Um, so yes, one, one option um, in terms of, um, we were talking about crossover. Um, there may be things about uh, understanding why that crossover is happening. I don't, I'm trying to read Will's intention. Understanding why the crossover is happening um, that are earlier in the process that you should be looking at instead. Um, things, so a change to the endpoint, again, uh, to things like um, tolerability or something along those lines that might help with understanding why that crossover is happening um, and can help you address that question in a different way. <laughs> Not yet. Sorry, Will. Um, Will, do you want me there? Oh, hang on. 
Um, so there's another, there's a question um, in the chat box uh, or in the Q&A um, that I'll answer and then I'll move to another question unless folks um, have others. So um, someone asked, what would you recommend for a sample size for dichotomous variables when the control rate is unknown in the literature? So in the dichotomous case, there's an easy solution, but it's going to yield a very large sample or a larger sample size. Um, which is to assume that the control rate is around 50%. So the, the binomial outcome um, is most variable when the control when the proportion is about 50%. And so assuming a proportion in the range of say 45 to 55 will give you the largest sample size that you might need. Um, but again, it's going to be the largest <laughs> sample size that you might need and that might, might be infeasible. Um, I would say if you really don't know what the control rate is, um, I'd ask what phase of study you're in, um, because maybe comparing two groups at that point is, is a little too, too far in the game. Um, maybe if you really don't know what the control rate is, maybe a trial to estimate the control rate with some precision should be the first step or could be the first step towards getting you to a place where you can compare uh, two groups to each other. So that's something to think about. Um, one of the things that comes up often in this course in particular, um, where we're sort of trying to, to lead you all to design early phase studies, is a question of um, how do I select the right dose? So I might know that there's this um, pharmaceutical intervention that I can use. There's a, an approved dose range for other indications. And um, you know, in, in many cases, we start the synopsis with a particular dose. And the first question that Will asks or that um, one of the other clinical faculty asks is, well, how sure are you about that dose? Where did it come from? Uh, and then we talk about it a little bit and we decide that we don't really know that that's the right dose. And so we want to do a study to confirm that. So one of the things to think very carefully about is what designs you might consider for selecting the right dose and understanding what the sample size implications are of each of those. Um, I mentioned earlier that it's not necessarily just the case of adding, if you needed 20 subjects to compare your dose and the control, it's not necessarily just adding another 20 subjects. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that when you're comparing an active dose to a control, the difference that you might see between an active and an inactive arm is likely different um, likely larger than the difference that you might see between two active doses, right? And so if you want to be powered to conduct a statistical hypothesis test to show that the larger dose is better than the smaller dose, that's going to require a larger sample size than if you were only testing the larger dose against the control. Um, if you have um, multiple doses that you're looking for. Uh, there are dose binding designs, which are based not on statistical hypothesis tests necessarily, but based on estimation of model parameters. Um, and those can be very efficient. Um, they are generally, they generally require simulation to evaluate what the sample size might be under various scenarios. So they do require a little more upfront work than just a, a parallel multi-group design, um, but they definitely can make more efficient use of the data in some cases, in many cases, um, than the typical design. Will, are you back? Can this be heard? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Karen, there's, um, there's another question in the Q&A. Okay. It's a good one. It, I, I can yeah. read it. it. Why is it said that estimating effect sizes for large confirmatory trials from small pilot studies is not a good idea? And I assume they mean using the effect size and not the variability. What should you, one do instead? 
Yeah, so um, why is it not a good idea? So what often happens in smaller studies, smaller studies tend to be conducted in um, one or two centers, which are really good at doing whatever the intervention is and managing care in whatever way that is specified by the protocol. Um, and in this small study, if there's an efficacy signal, it's probably large, large enough that it makes you excited about moving forward, right? When the trial is then opened up into a large confirmatory study, oftentimes what happens is that uh, it goes from one or two really, really good, tight, um, operating, uh, well-qualified sites, and it gets opened up to 50 or 100 sites who have varying levels of uh, experience with the intervention. Um, sometimes the eligibility criteria are loosened up a bit. And oftentimes what we see then is that the effect size that we see in that large confirmatory trial is much smaller than what we saw in the pilot study which supported it. Um, so that's sort of the, the reason why, that's one of the reasons why we say it's not a good idea. The real reason I think that it's not a good idea is because regardless of how good you think an intervention is, in many cases, when you start thinking about what effect size would be sufficient for me to change my practice, what effect size would be sufficient for the community to stop not treating these patients or to stop using the standard of care, um, the effect size that would change practice is much smaller than the ones that are used to support the development into phase three. Um, and you would hate to miss those, right? Um, for those of you who know Dr. Barson, he talks about sort of doing this post-mortem of clinical trials before the trial gets started, right? And so if you design a study saying my pilot study, my phase two showed a 20% improvement in mortality, um, and that's how I'm going to design my phase three, but you ask the question, what if in phase three you only saw a 10% improvement in mortality? Isn't that enough? Wouldn't you want to say that was, that was an improvement and change practice based on it? And if that's the case, then what you really want to do is design the confirmatory study for the smallest difference, which is clinically meaningful. Now, in some cases, that sample size is infeasible, right? We talk to people all the time who say a 2% increase in mortality would be enough. Um, but it's very, it, the, the sample sizes at some point are going to be just astronomical and, and are not going to be doable. But you really want to think about what is that lower bound? What is the smallest effect that would make me say, gosh, we should really be using this in everyone? Um, and design the study so that you have enough power to answer the question for that effect. You know, Will, do you want to add anything to that from a clinical <clears throat> Yeah, and I think that that really hits the points very nicely. And I think, I mean, as you, a, a small sample size estimate is not more accurate. And I, I think also if there's 100 people out there doing 10 to 20 patient studies, there's this multiplicity issue. If, if all those things are null, a couple of them are going to look really good. And, you know, you don't know if that's because the treatment's really good. And I think as clinicians, we certainly we, we are always positive, right? We know that we are researching the stuff that works. Um, so it, it, this has come out in, in you know in, in books about uh, behavioral economics and so forth. That we think if our treatment we see that really big spike in that ten to twenty patient trial, we believe that that's the thing to go for. But I think we have to realize that you know, wouldn't we be sad if there was this smaller effect that is actually meaningful. I do also think that it is it is challenging because so many of the outcomes are dichotomous to really get wrap your head around what is going to change practice and so forth and knowing that you know as you go down to lower numbers you may not it may not be feasible to answer that question based on the priorities of funding and the priorities of society even if you know, a, a, a one digit absolute risk difference would be something that would be very meaningful for patients because you're treating a lot of patients with that. Um, so it's, it's a tricky issue. Um, NINDS actually in their clinical trials FOAs has a specific statement about 
not um, it's, and, and the rationale for why you should not have an aim of estimating an effect size. Now, I think as one of the earlier questions was was asking, um, you know, if you really don't know the natural history of a disease when you've done a really good unbiased or less biased perspective study, then that is something that perhaps you need to learn. Or you know, so there are things that you can learn in early phase studies other than the difference across groups, the variability in your outcome measure and other things. And, you know, the, if for a binary outcome, you know, what the event rate is in the control state. Um, but knowing that those things are going to be from a single center, they're going to suffer from some of the issues that Sharon brings up. And that even if you're looking at the event rate for, say, disability after stroke, just because different patients are going to show up at different centers, you know, you're going to know it for your site, but there's, there's going to be a range when you look at it across other sites. So you have to be, you know, you, but if it's a novel outcome measure in a rare disease, learning a lot more about the variability of that, you know, there may not be too much site to site variability because it's a really rare disease and the experts are across the country are all sort of taking care of it similarly. Um, and, and, the, and the patients just are really kind of just showing up to 10 centers nationwide. So it, it definitely depends on your situation, whether it's a rare disease, acute disease, chronic disease, um, or common disease. Um, another question popped up here. Um, is there any consideration that should be given to intention to treat analysis versus as treated analysis to power analysis? In addition, if you do both analyses, if the as treated is different than the intention to treat, does this qualify as crossover? Yeah, so um, that's that's a hard question because I think it depends a lot on what phase of study you're in, and I think it depends a lot on um, how likely you are um, to have this this crossover. Excuse me, just a second. Okay, um, so the. Intention to treat analysis is considered the gold standard for confirmatory trials, um, but it is not, um, not necessarily the way to go for earlier phase studies. You may really want to understand what the effect is of the intervention when it's used as you intend for it to be used, right? There can be important information gains from that, but you wanna specify that in advance. So if you're gonna use a modified intention to treat, um, where only patients who actually initiate the intervention um, are included or things like that. I think that can be okay in earlier phase studies, but again, you wanna pre-specify that. Um, the issue of crossover, so you will know whether there is crossover um, based on the treatment information that you capture. If the as treated information is uh, conclusion is different than the intention to treat conclusion, um, then that does tell you something about whether that crossover actually impacted the findings, right? The intention to treat is intended to reflect what will happen when it's released into the general public um, because people are not gonna take it as they're directed to and things like that. Um, so you really wanna think about what, uh, how those conclusions differ and use that information to draw sort of more general statements. Um, another question is, um, could you elaborate on sample size calculation in pilot trials when the standardized effect size is not known? Also any comments on rules of thumb suggested in literature for effect sizes in these scenarios? Are such rules of thumb ever acceptable in the absence of preliminary data? Um, so yes, um, the I, I have heard the rules of thumb. I've reviewed grants using the rules of thumb. Um, I think in uh, if it is at all possible, um, even if you're using a standardized effect size to design your pilot study it is important to consider what that might translate to in terms of your outcome. So if you don't know what the variability in your outcome is, you could still say for a couple of plausible values uh, of variability on that outcome, a standardized effect size of 0.1 will translate to a difference of 
three units on the NIH stroke scale or, or whatever. So that whoever you're trying to sell this idea to has some sense as to what that really means. Um, I'm afraid I comment on that a lot in, in grant reviews because I, I want to know what, what that effect size means. Um, point, if, if you designed a study, frankly, for a standardized effect size of 0.1, I might not say anything at all because it's such a small standardized effect size. Um, but if you're designing a study for a standardized effect size of 0.7 or 0.8, um, I would be likely to comment on it and say that's, that's a really large effect and they're not saying what it is that that means. And so I don't know whether that the sample size is really sufficient. Um, so I think it's, it's okay to move forward with a standardized effect size, but I think uh, you really want to try to give the reviewer um, some indication as to what that means in terms of the actual outcome that you're measuring. Um, I would also say that for pilot studies, it's not necessarily the case that you have to be going after um, being able to compare two groups uh, in order to establish superiority. Right? There, are, there are other ways to do that. You could try instead to show that the effect size is less than some value. You could be trying to estimate the rate of response with some level of precision. Um, there, again, there, there are questions that you, can, uh, that you can answer that get specifically at the pieces of information that you're missing. And so if you're in a place where you don't know anything in the literature about this, this outcome or this control group, um, I would really caution you as to whether what you're trying to do, if it's compared to groups, whether that's the right space to be in. And you could also consider whether, you know, that the comparison or the effect size is really the ideal main outcome for that pilot study. And it, it probably isn't. Um, it may be something that you need to be considering and, and provide some estimates on, but the estimates maybe need to be more granular. You know, obviously, if the control treatment is beating the, or, or you know, looking like it, 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 you know, it's numerically superior to the new treatment, um, that would be a downer, right? Like that, 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 that ought to be a signal that, that, you know, you need to change something, whether it's the intervention, the population, or something, and I think you, um, but you could consider whether output could be, you know, a table of, of probabilities, you know, the prob after we have, you know, we're looking at ensuring people are adherence as a main outcome in a feasibility study, and then at the end, you can provide a table of, here's a table of the probability of what we observed being over these effect sizes of, you know, you know whether they're standardized, you know, there's 95% probability we had an effect size of at least 0.1, um, but there's there's maybe only a 50% probability that it's over 0.5, and I think that that can help that can provide information that can help the that you in terms of what you need to be you know scaling your next trial at. And that would take into account both the variability that you observe, but the, the, there's uncertainty both in that variability and in the responses that you see. Um, I think I will ask one additional question, and if others have any other additional questions, we can start to pop those into the chat. Um, I think, well, there's a couple, a couple of our stock questions that I think are kind of fun. Um, so maybe we'll do two if we, if nobody else has any. Um, what do, what do I do if I am having trouble connecting with a statistician? Yes. So um, many of the um, many of your institutions will have departments, biostatistics departments. Um, sorry, there's a. <laughs> I have a yeah. Um, many of your institutions will have biostatistics departments, departments of public health sciences, um, CTSAs that you can go to for help with statistical design and analysis. Um, some of them may have clinical trials groups that you can contact. Um, if, if you've reached out, and I know, I know some places are moving towards sort of a, um, I've heard from a couple people that their places are turning into this sort of pay to play model where you have to have funds in order to, um, to initiate talks with them. Um, then I think you, 
there's nothing stopping you from going outside of your institution. You may have collaborating institutions um, who have these services, or you may have uh, other folks who are interested in the same topic that you are, who have relationships with their statisticians, um, and they can sort of get you, get you linked in. Depending on what your area of interest is, some of the networks will have data centers um, that also do statistics, and you can get linked up with one of them. Um, if you're really struggling and you've gone through, you've talked to your collaborators on the particular project you're, you're looking for or other projects and you can't find someone, um, your institution is, is on a pay to play um, sort of plan or doesn't have the, the bandwidth for, for additional work. Um, I think, uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna speak, I am gonna speak for Will, um, that you're welcome to reach out to any of your course faculty um, and they should be able to find someone the other thing that I might suggest is that depending on the phase of study, um, you may be able to, one way to get at uh, this issue of bandwidth is to propose that perhaps you can have a, um, a graduate student in biostatistics who will do the bulk of the work, but with some oversight by a faculty member. So a faculty member who doesn't have time to take on an additional grant development right now may have you know an hour a week or something to oversee a graduate student to do that same work so that's another possibility yeah and i think that those are really really good points i think one other point to think of is think about developing a relationship before you need it um you know i think when you're on a crunch to design a grant or design a trial things are a bit more fraught if you have a if you have a, a set of data and a project using existing data that you're working on building that's on a i guess more leisurely timeline that's a great time to start to scientifically collaborate with a statistician so they can get to know you and the disease um you know the grants due tomorrow is is not much they can do at that point um so i think I, you know it, i would encourage people to um and, and obviously, depending on the complexity, um, you know, for many of us, you know, who do, do clinical stuff, we also feel like we can kind of figure any, anything out. Like, oh yeah, I can just, you know, I can click a bunch of boxes in SPSS and I can, I can get a full out logistic regression. And I think you wanna think about making those relationships in advance because I think they can be really valuable and they can, they can benefit both parties. Our, our research is, is stronger when we partner with biostatisticians as opposed to because they are they are great scientists and we don't want to you know and we want to have collaboration because they, even before you design an analysis they can think of things for you that maybe you weren't thinking of that can make your analysis much better um so i think but but trying to have those wins and build those relationships prior to the need for the grants or the next design can be can be really beneficial All right, well, Joy, it looks like you put the evaluation link into the Q&A or into the chat box. Um, any, um, again, I wanna, I mean, I, I want to really thank you all for spending some time uh, thinking about this. And I, I really wanna to thank Dr. Yates for taking some time to, to present on this area. She is, I mean, we were, wish we were all in person doing this, um, but it's not too bad to, to try to do a little bit of this over the uh, electronic uh methods so anything else joy um no but um i just wanted to say thank you again and um our next webinar is on august 4th um on rare disease trials so um keep an eye out for our email no notification for that and, and probably the end of this week so thanks all right well, thank you all for your attention and we will see some of you soon. Great, thanks guys, take care.